Uh, so good evening everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure of talking to you about statistical modelling in sports. And in the short time that I have with you this evening, I hope to convince you three things. That it's dynamic, that it's data rich, and that it's difficult. Uh, so before I begin, I'll just introduce myself. Um, my name is Grace Sterling. Um, I'm originally from a small seaside town called Bangor, just outside of Belfast in Northern Ireland. In 2004, I moved to the northeast of England and I completed my undergraduate MMAT at Durham University. I stayed on with the department for three more years as a KTP associate, basically training to become a statistician working on a project with GPs on call volumes and staffing levels. And in 2011, I moved on to the sunny southwest of England and I've been a sports statistician at AF. So sports, it's fun, it's exciting, it's cool. Um, you only have to spend 10 minutes on the BBC Sport website and you can watch Rory McIlroy make his first professional hole in one. You can recall Lewis Hamilton winning the Formula One Championship in November. You can remember a time when Andy Murray <coughs> won the Grand Slam final against Zubak Djokovic, and conversely when he lost in the Grand Slam final against Zubak Djokovic. You can also get opinions. So there were matches last weekend from the six nations. <coughs> Straight away, there's information, there's thoughts about what the score should have been, even though the score has already happened. And you can get opinions about events that haven't even happened yet. So the Cricket World Cup is about to start uh, a couple of weeks in Australia New Zealand, and there are all sorts of thoughts about who might win that. So now, thinking about sport being dynamic, I sort of pose the question, which sport is this? For those that can't see, uh, the biggest clue on this graph is ball number. It goes from 0 to 250, and we've got win probability up on the y-axis. We've got two lines, one which is model, the red line. That's our sport model, and we've also got a market line. And that just refers to some sort of online betting exchange where people are actually trading at those probabilities. So they're paying a price to actually get <coughs> a win at that period in time. Any thoughts? Cricket. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Ball numbers, way. So for those of you that uh, never watch cricket, um, each team gets a chance to bat, each team gets a chance to field. You're trying to score as many runs as possible. You work in over, so 2020 cricket, you have 20 over for each team, there's six balls in an over, which makes 240 balls with a couple of new balls, we get our 250. So you can see <coughs> it's in two halves. So this is the team one batting, and this is the team one fielding. And you can see the sort of significant events which change the win probabilities. So the yellow lines end up being sixes, that means the batter has hit the ball. Uh, out, of, out of the court without hitting the ground, <coughs> and the probability is up, and then purple lines and wickets, so they've been called out and they've lost the man to that. What's interesting about this picture is that the model market actually begin quite close together, and after the first sort of significant event, uh, the model actually <coughs> sort of rewards the team more than the market. You get to the end of the first half where this team is not finishing their buying session and it's just converged quite closely again. And then the second half it all just gets a bit crazy then. So it was a very exciting match. <laughs> uh, so just with that in mind, it, you know, it really is quite like this is one cricket match and you can just go into so much detail with that alone in order to anything else. So the next point is that it's that rich. There are so many websites with so much free information and there are so many competitions, competitions and events that happen every year. You've always got your football premiership, you've always got your tennis grand you've always got your golf majors, you've got your big international competitions every four years. The next two um, points debatable in the list, that sort of starts to bring in the challenges of, um, of the industry. So there is so much information, you have to decide how much you're going to collect, if you're going to collect a lot, how are you going to store that? And what on earth are you going to use to put in your model? Um, quick example of some freely available data. You can go to tennisdata.co.uk and you can get all men's tour results 
match result and then all well, back to two dots and just just bring it over. So that brings me to my final point. Last two minutes. It's difficult. <coughs> Building statistical models in sport, like in any other area of statistics, you have to work quite hard. Within our office, we've got about 15 researchers. They all come in, they all get to use a sort of nice statistical package called R, and they all collaborate on ideas. Um, this is quite a nice example of, of how difficult it can be. So the story here is that this guy, Andrew Steele, wanted to um, join his work syndicate for the World Cup in the summer and had to predict all the outcomes of the World Cup matches, all the goals scored from the way. He didn't know anything about football, so he built a very basic model based on scoring rates from the previous World Cup matches, which is about 800 matches in total. And when the surprising event of the 7-1 defeat against Brazil happened, he was surprised to be surprised. So he sort of looked into what his uh, probability of that would have, would have been. And so this is, this, this is uh, his result. This is his model. These are his results. And you can look at the article yourself. Um, the red line is his prediction. The green bars are the results that happened up to that point of the World Cup, so it hadn't quite finished yet. And you can sort of see his chance of there being any team at all in, in the competition scoring six. He didn't expect there to be any, and let them seven goals, which we observed well. So I think his final probability was about greater than a thousand to one. Um, something like that. So he just sort of he just sort of uh, raised this voice of how can you make this better? Is that really a once in a lifetime event or is that just natural variation? And we might expect to see it again in the next World Cup. Who knows? So it's quite a difficult question to answer. I don't have the answer to it, so I'm going to it to you this evening. Um, but it just it just gives a show being difficult, it's, it's interesting, it, it makes you think you're going to be challenged um, in any other <coughs> in the industry. So I've got 30 seconds left, I will leave it there, and I have to put one shameless plug in. I believe you've got another leaflet on your chairs. Um, ATAS run a yearly PhD workshop, and one's coming up this June. So if anyone is a PhD student and is interested in modelling statistics in sport in real time, um, read the leaflet, come and talk to me, and uh, see you in June. Thanks.